Hello, everybody, dear students, colleagues, and friends of architecture. I would like to welcome you at the third lecture of uh, this year's November Talks. Uh, as you know, November Talks uh, is uh, happening every November. It's a lecture series happening in several European cities, thanks to the initiative and financial support of the Foundation STO. Uh, I would also like to welcome Karen Cook, who is a dear guest because she is returning to Prague after 20 years. She has several friends here from 20 years ago when she was the leading design architect for KPF and for the two large buildings. Everybody knows the Danube House and the Nile House at the River City, which is the Rohanski Ostrov development. Karen Cook uh, made a, a, a big way, went a big way uh, from that time on. She uh, left KPF after several years in 2009 with four other architects. It's one of, it was one of the biggest breakaways that was published in all architecture journals and started co-started a company PLP Architecture in London, and this company has grown in the following 13 years into a company that makes a half a billion Czech crowns turnover. Karen decided uh, to leave the company this year and start her own spice studio and uh, I'm very excited about all her experience because she just finished, just before making this uh, life decision, she finished the second highest skyscraper in London, Bishopsgate 22, which is a very futuristic, that's why it is on this year's November Talks, very futuristic, but also very urban skyscraper. It's a skyscraper that uh, blended all the individual high-rises in London that many of you have seen popping up with this kind of feeling like, what's happening in London, you know? I mean, what's happening? Is it smallpox or like, what's going on? And then th this one skyscraper suddenly made common sense out of all those that were around it. And when you travel to London now, you're surprised by the quality, by the urban quality of the city center. So I'm really happy to have Karen here. And uh, you have a lot of time. You don't have to hurry. We had people which were talking more in a visionary manner. So they were talking about the future without really having super buildings built, like uh, Alice Cabaret, for instance. And Karen is a person who is feet deep into very complex technical solutions at the edge of sustainability know-how that we have in this world now. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Irena, for inviting me to speak tonight. And thank you, all of you, for coming, and especially my friends in the audience. It's really great to see you. Um, I th oops, wrong way. OK. I um, did first come to Prague in, well, probably before most of you were born, in fact, uh, 1999. Um, and I was invited to help design uh, some buildings at River City, and I, I'm not going to lecture about this tonight, I just wanted you to know a little bit more about me. Um, and as well, the sister building, Nile House. At the time, there was nothing on Rohanski and Abreji, so uh, these buildings had to create little internal worlds for the people who would work there. And if you haven't been inside, I would encourage you to visit. Um, they are open to the public, you can walk in. Um, and they have an amazing variety of very beautifully detailed um, craftsmen uh, from stone and glass and metal work uh, that I think really 
gave the buildings a singular identity and, and opened my eyes uh, as a commercial architect to a way of working in a building that actually wasn't possible at the time in London or um, Germany. <clears throat> um, and this is an internal view looking back toward the castle from one of the high-level walkways. This is the staircase in Nile House, uh, which was designed by my partner, Jean Lelay. Uh, we met uh, working together on, on this project in Prague, so we're very happy now that we're founding our company, Spice, together. Um, and more images of the interior of Nile House, looking back at Carlene, which has changed a lot as well in, in two decades. Um, Irena mentioned that I uh, have other experience in tall buildings and um, another one, again, I'm not going to lecture about tonight, it could be a, a topic in itself, is the refurbishment of tall buildings. Um, the, the building used to look like the one on the left uh, and uh, again, as a result of a design competition, um, we transformed it for another 50 years, hopefully. It was built in 1972 um, and we added more floor space, we added more floors, we removed some floors, and we cut three-story spaces in six locations in the building to offer different ways of working for people. Um, I do small buildings as well. Uh, this is a, a, a tiny building with a grand name. It's the headquarters of Qatar Airways in London. Um, it's a stone building. Um, I should mention that the only all-glass building I've ever designed is 22 Bishop's Gate. Um, so in this instance, in, in the Qatar Airways building, we were able to work with <clears throat> computer technology to craft the stone in a way that uh, now by hand would be unaffordable. And then another stone building, also in the city of London, um, is designed for Fidelity headquarters. And this building is a, a, quite the opposite of 22 Bishop's Gate in the sense that it's a, an exclusively designed to fit into the historic townscape. We're looking at a Wren, Christopher Wren designed St. Nicholas Cole Abbey. And the building steps away and then down the hill <clears throat> to offer this... Um, important view, uh, well, important today, it wasn't actually Wren's original viewpoint, but, and it creates this pocket park on the right-hand side for people working in the city. 22 Bishop's Gate uh, had a very long life <laughs> before it was born into the building it is today. Um, it does occupy a very important site in the foundation, in the financial district. Um, the financial district, or so-called square mile, is where uh, maybe 10% of the nation's tax revenue is generated. <clears throat> so it's a very um, uh, small surface area with uh, pre-pandemic over 500,000 commuters per day. Um, and it's served by all the mainline rail stations that come into London, uh, with the exception of one. They all stop at the edge of the city. And over time, um, I, as I mentioned, I started working on this site in 2003 for a different design, a different client, different set of needs. I mean, architects work to serve the needs of the people. And in the, in the year 2000 or 2003, London had very few tall buildings. Um, most of the tall buildings were social housing and were very unpopular with the public. And the city planner was very reluctant to authorize new tall buildings, but they had to do something because the tenants were all moving out to Canary Wharf. And because London has 33 different boroughs, different governmental boroughs, they compete with each other um, rather than functioning as a whole city. So the city of London, which has been the center of trade in the UK for 2000 years, wanted to do something to bring those tenants back into the city. And they realized that they needed bigger buildings. Um, but initially they were all going to be the same height. So 183 meters, which is the height of the NatWest Tower. If I can red pointer work. This is the, the original NatWest Tower. It was for a long time a solitary tower on the city uh, skyline. And we 
talked about what it would mean if all the buildings were 183 meters tall and that you would end up sort of with this Hilbersheimer view of Berlin with everything the same height and maybe that that's not really the way a city should grow. Um, the, the other major topic, of course, in discussion was the Cathedral of St. Paul and how to protect the importance and the relevance of St. Paul as, as a national monument. And you have to imagine that St. Paul for the British people symbolizes um, surviving World War II because everything around it was completely obliterated. So it's not only a religious monument, it's a um, symbol of national history. So the city planners uh, decided that it would make sense to create a cluster, what they call a cluster, of tall buildings that would eventually form a group and allow St. Paul's to be physically separated. So the gap of sky space between the new tall buildings and St. Paul's Cathedral is very important um, to allow St. Paul's to, to have its presence as, in fact, the original tall building of the city. And when the first tall buildings were built, um, in fact, it didn't serve that purpose because you had solitary buildings again built. Um, they were quite eye-catching and they were very popular and they globalized um, London. They, they made London recognizable globally, the, the Gherkin being perhaps the most iconic of that group. And now you see um, 22 Bishop's Gate at the center of this group. And after the global financial crisis, the city planners realized that they needed to relook at why they were building tall buildings because, in fact, then as today, the question was, why would anyone ever want to work in an office again? <clears throat> so they did some research um, and discovered that actually people want to work in an office because they want to meet other people. It's not so much because it's the best place to work, but it's the best place to meet friends possibly to meet your spouse, um, and certainly to, to enjoy yourself simply. So this is a timeline uh, that shows the last two decades uh, of the site. Um, it was originally bought by a German pension fund, and then we were hired to build this, um, at the time I was at KPF, to build and to design this iconic building, which was called the Pinnacle. It was sold once they got planning permission to a Saudi bank, who did start construction and then the global financial crisis happened and they didn't have the funds and, they, and no one would buy it because to invest in such a large building requires um, the, side, the size of capital that only a small number of companies can, can afford globally. So they, they eventually, um, eventually I started working, well, eventually I should say that's when we founded our new company, PLP Architecture, and we started working with a new developer, Sir Stuart Lipton, who um, has a lot of experience coming up with what's the best new idea for a commercial building. And <clears throat> um, finally, AXA, with other three other companies, um, provided funding for the building, and it was completed in November 2020 during the, lo during the lockdown of the pandemic. <clears throat> and now it's 90% um, leased. But as I said, the, the question was, why would people want to come back to work in a building? The, the um, number of commuters to the city had plummeted after the global financial crisis. People had lost their jobs <clears throat> and no one felt that a bank would be loyal to them anyway. So one of the um, research uh, results was that buildings needed to be better environmentally. So better sustainably and more comfortable. Um, in fact, you should feel better after being at the office than you do as if you had stayed at home. So that means better air quality, <clears throat> more art, uh, more variety of spaces, um, places to work out, healthy food. Um, and so we were the first building in the UK to register for a, a new standard called the Well Standard, and, and I know there are now other standards like that. And Stuart Lipton came up with this idea that there should be a vertical village. Um, you know, his, his model being that if you have a, a village, everyone gathers in the center to meet their friends, 
they go to the, their office there, they go to lunch there, <clears throat> they go to the doctor there. And how could we provide that same variety of uses in a tall building? And he worked with several different types of consultants to come up with um, actually a very basic approach. So food, fitness, health, um, relaxation, and learning. Um, and <clears throat> that means there's a floor where the entire floor is dedicated to food. Um, you can order the food from your smartphone uh, in advance. Uh, you can order a couple of days in advance if you want, and that helps reduce food waste. There are different types of um, food. There's restaurant food. There's <clears throat> changing um, pop-up stalls like street market stalls to give a bit more variety and to give small independents the opportunity to try to function in, in a larger management. Um, and, and, the, and I should mention that the food level is open all day long. So if you want to work between meals outside, well, first you can eat all day if you like, <laughs> but you can also work between meals um, outside the office. Um, there's a floor dedicated to co-working. Um, those offer memberships to people outside the building, and that's where Spice is based at the moment. Um, <clears throat> and they have, in addition to workspace, they have broadcasting studios or um, video conferencing booths um, and the seminar space for up to 60 people so we could give a lecture. <clears throat> um, the idea of the gym, again, how do you take the critical mass of a tall building population because the, the building is designed to house 12,000 people um, and offer something that your gym at home doesn't offer. So, in fact, this rendering was the um, spontaneous whim of the um, rendering company, Miller Hair, and it became one of the um, go-to images for the building. And, in fact, the, the, the um, tenant who rented the gym actually then did install the glass climbing wall because it had become sort of identified with the building. Um, and the idea of the retreat is, in fact, opposite, to offer people who want to chill out or, you know, some people like to do buzzy things, other people prefer secluded things or to go to your GP, your medical doctor, if you, if you need um, to avoid staying home for the day. At the top of the building is an amenity which is open to the public. It's a free to access every day until 6 p.m. Um, it was required by the mayor. Uh, all the new tall buildings in London will now have a free viewing gallery. Um, it remains to be seen how popular they are. I think they will be popular at the beginning, but um, if there's no activity there, I'm not sure about that, so we'll see. Um, but it was, it was meant to encourage young people who live within eyesight of the city, but maybe feel that the city is out of reach for them, to feel welcome and to come into the city and to appropriate the building and uh, think about the fact that why not think about working there one day. At the base of the building, we have a um, car park for four parking spaces. So those are for disabled spaces. That's it. There are no car parking. Um, there are 1,700 bicycle parking spaces. And with that, the... Um, developer decided that they needed to offer a much wider facility because it could become <clears throat> unmanageable if not. So there's showers and lockers and free towels that are clean. There's places to dry your clothes if you come in when it's raining, place to repair your bicycle, place to wash your bicycle. We worked with a graphic designer, Cartledge Levine, to... Um, because 1,700 spaces are a lot of spaces, so we had to find ways to organize the, visually organize that. This is a rendering, but it um, shows the east face of the building. I'll come around to the principal side, Bishop's Gate, in a bit. Um, in fact, the main aim of the city planners as we were developing our ideas was how to integrate a, a large population of another 12,000 people into a small spot um, <clears throat> in terms of safety and, and comfort for the pedestrian. So that means how do we deal with wind? How do we deal with vehicles? How do we deal with all the bicycles? This image shows a piece of the public hi highway, which is the elevated part, <clears throat> which was accessed by road from behind the building to your right. 
um, and we closed that. Um, it's still officially public highway, but it's pedestrianized so that it's safer to approach the building. Um, the red spot lower down is where the bicycles go in and the road goes off to the left for vehicles to serve um, for the deliveries. But the main um, principal question was how do people move around the city? And if you've visited London, you'll see that it has Roman roads. So, um, oops. Um, Bishop's Gate, which is this street here, <clears throat> is one of the original Roman roads from uh, around the year 42 AD. And the other routes are largely medieval routes, so that, that's why they're winding. And, and if you come into the city on a public transport and you arrive on a train station, the quickest way to anywhere is on those larger roads, but they're actually quite miserable to walk along. There's too much traffic, quite a lot of wind. So you see people trying to find their way through <clears throat> the sort of capillary network of the smaller streets. And what we're trying to do is offer one of those little streets um, by, by making this public passageway under the building. It's open 24 hours. There are no gates, no doors, no anything. It's always open. Um, because otherwise people had to walk I mean, even before the building was built, the, this uh, block was, went from here all the way down to here. Um, so there, there was, sorry, from, from here all the way down to here. So there was no other way across the street. And many people are arriving at Bank Tube Station, the bank being the center of the square mile, and heading off to the other skyscrapers in this area called the Cluster. So this little network gives people uh, another way, um, and and to, to reduce the number of vehicles, almost stopped the project because we were really stuck. The the um, city planner said, "Well, even if you have twelve thousand people there, you can't have more deliveries." So the owner found, uh, or the developer found, uh, an army logistics expert who proposed a very simple idea, which is the same if you ever have groceries delivered at home or Amazon delivery, it's more or less the same thing. So any private, uh, because it, often you would have vehicles arriving at the building with one package in the vehicle. So you end up having a, a large heavy vehicle transporting one little package for you driving around the city and clogging up the streets and hitting bicycles and so on. So now, they, all the tenants have to oblige by what's called a consolidated delivery management system, which means that all the goods are packed, sorry, all the goods, if they're addressed to the building, all the goods are delivered to a warehouse outside the city. They're then scanned for identification purposes, pack, repackaged into smaller hybrid electric vehicles, and when the vehicle is full, they come back to the building. Tenants also have the option to store their goods at the warehouse and then um, ask for them on demand so that instead of paying for storage space in the building, they can use the storage space at the vehicle, at the warehouse. So this has reduced trips to the building by over 80%, which means that we can deliver all the needs that the building has outside of pedestrian commuter hours and from breakfast commute, lunch commute, and evening commute, this, the, there are no vehicle trips to the building at all. They're completely suppressed. I mentioned wind. Um, wind is always an issue for a tall building. It's usually considered for the stability structure because the, the more wind um, is diverted around the building, the less work there is on the structure and the less weight the structure has and the, and the more economical the building is. We also have to test the building in London for wind, um, for pedestrian comfort. And uh, I would urge you uh, to consider this before you design the shape of the building and not after. <laughs> um, but anyway, we, the, the, the rule is in the, in the city of London that we, we mustn't make the wind conditions any worse than they already are, and it ideally improve them if possible. Um, and so we worked uh, with the wind tunnel, with engineers at the wind tunnel, 
We also worked with automotive sport uh, engineers, and the advantage that they offer is very sophisticated uh, computational fluid dynamic analysis. Their computers are a lot more uh, powerful than a, a mechanical engineer computer. And the um, CFD analysis could show what the possible problems would be and the probable cause, because they can work backwards and find the vector point where there's a problem and then propose solutions that we could then test in the wind tunnel. So there was this iterative back and forth process, which was um, resulting in a very basic solution, which was a very large canopy. Um, the canopy is uh, situated at about 16 or 17 meters above the street level. We proposed that the canopy be made out of ultra high strength fiber reinforced concrete. Um, the main reason um, for proposing the concrete is that it has a large self-weight because, in fact, we have to deal with not only with the downdraft of wind, but the updraft as well. As, as the wind goes around the whole cluster, it, it rejoins and creates a very uh, high acceleration vertical updraft. So the self-weight of the um, concrete is better than glass. The other reason we used it is because with the facets of the building, which I haven't explained yet. Um, the different geometry created some very um, irregular shapes that if you were to cut those in steel or um, glass would be uh, messy. Well, in, in this product, this product is actually different than concrete. It's, um, if you're not familiar with it, that basically it does not use steel reinforcement bars. It uses small filaments so that the whole product is much thinner. It was developed initially because it, it um, is self-cleaning. It eats, con it eats uh, pollution. Um, and we believed that it was the right solution from a townscape viewpoint because the building sits opposite historic conservation area of buildings that are all in Portland stone. And so the minerality and the um, soft gray ivory color blends well with the conservation area. And it gives the base of the building permission to have a different character than the glass and steel tower above. So the glass and steel tower above being the sort of ideal workspace. For me, the base of the building is where you see the, the messiness of human life actually exposed. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's the, it is the uh, second tallest building in London. It's the largest office building in London. Um, and it, it needs to have, therefore, a scale commensurate at the base with the, with the tower above. Um, and the foyer functions to serve not only the lifts that take people to the offices, but to the food court and to the top of the building um, and to se se seminar spaces. We were very fortunate that um, the technology was advancing alongside um, because the artwork that we wanted to incorporate into the building um, normally at a, at, a, at a building this scale it's very difficult to actually incorporate the art into the architecture you often see large pieces of artwork purchased and placed in front of a building but but for us we wanted to really incorporate the artwork into the design and thanks to the glass printing technology um, we were able to work with an artist who normally works in glass, um, but in this instance, he, he worked, he made his artwork directly in a computer file, and this was shared with a printing company in Germany, SIDAC, <clears throat> who normally print that little black edge you see around the glass to hide the sealant behind. They had no idea that they could provide something so colorful or such large scale, um, and Alex's Inspiration were the crest and mantle colors of the guilds in London, which are still thriving today. <clears throat> Inside, sorry. Inside the foyer, we, we also wanted it to feel to people to feel welcome, to feel relaxed. Um, sometimes a corporate building at this scale can feel intimidating. Um, and people feel, especially for a first-time visitor, they feel perhaps lost. And if you are working there, you can feel uh, a little bit turned off by the dullness of the, of the perfection of the finishes. 
Um, and in this case, we, we opted to work um, with art work that could be changed. So the idea is that every year um, there will be new artwork. This is partly to appease tenants because artwork is very emotional. Um, some people love a particular piece and other people don't understand it or even hate it. Um, so we, we worked with two artists to provide some large scale um, and some smaller scale work. Um, the, the largest pieces being by a French photographer uh, based in New York, Karine Laval. Um, and she takes photographs of gardens and this series is called Heterotopia. And we also worked with a British painter, uh, Ryan Mosley, who um, is normally a figure painter, um, but because we were asking him to do some quite, for, for him, several pieces in a short time frame, um, he elected to work with a, another artist who makes um, costumes and stage sets. So he is doing the figure drawing and creating the colors, and she is doing some of the sewing onto his tapestries. We worked together with a leather craftsman uh, who is based in London, Bill Amberg. And again, the combination of the technology and the handcraft was possible where the, the twisted elements are made as a, a computer-shaped mold. Um, and then the, the leather work is hand-stitched around the, the mold pieces. Um, and architecturally, the idea here is that um, you know, again, you come into a large building, it can feel intimidating or confusing. And the traditional reception area is designed to make you feel as if you're sinking into a giant English leather chair um, with sort of cocooning you and comforting you. Uh, the wall behind you is leather as well. And it's to create this feeling of movement and exuberance, uh, which you don't always find in, a, in an office building. <clears throat> the furniture, or I should say the sculptural piece uh, is designed by Pierre Renard, who is a young furniture maker from France. Um, for, and uh, he hand makes the, the pieces in um, laminated sheets of, of walnut. The artwork inside the lift car is provided by Bill McLean, a Scottish artist based in London. Um, his artwork are collages and then they're photographed at high resolution and printed onto the glass. And that allowed us to have eight different works. So there are eight different lift cars in a single group. Um, and each lift car has a different artwork. So you get a little bit of variety. Um, the, the opening into the lift car is uh, asymmetrical. So that again, you provide some orientation when you get out of the lift. Again, in a tall building, it can be very confusing if there are a lot of people and you don't know which way is out. <laughs> um, I should mention that the, the building um, is designed for 11,500 workforce plus 500 people of the public occupying the top at any given time. And so there are a lot of lifts in the building. Um, we use double deck lifts for both the public and the office. Um, and we have uh, 24 double deck lifts, <clears throat> so 48 cars, um, plus three at one end for serving the lower base of the building, so it's a lot of lifts. Um, we tried to bring art and craft into the um, back of house finishes also, but, um, so the stairwell is brightly lit and colorful with, again, graphic design. I mentioned that the building is faceted, um, and uh, the reasoning for that has to do with how do you break down such a large mass. Um, the building, the client wanted that the building be built um, out of repetitive pieces. So that means rather than all the unique shapes that the other towers have with very small towers, floors at the top, we have very large floors that go all the way up. But the facets help dematerialize the large building when you see it uh, on the skyline. And I'll show you some images of that. And it gives it different dimensions for different types of workspace because at the time we designed the building, they were looking at primarily financial, legal, or um, insurance um, occupants. Um, now, of course, everyone is tech, <laughs> um, including the banks and the insurance companies, not quite the lawyers yet. Um, 
when you see the building stepping, the idea is that it's joining together, as Irena was describing, it's joining together the other tall buildings and trying to pull them into a single cluster. Um, and I should mention there are still some more tall buildings along the way, which will again start to fill in the few gaps that remain so that it will read as a, as a co coherent um, skyline with, with a peak at the center. There are two other buildings that are, well, one other building that's consented, which is just a few meters taller. From this perspective, they will appear to be the same height. Uh, and then an, another one has been submitted, which is uh, slightly taller, which is to the left, um, just behind the NatWest Tower. But that doesn't have consent yet. And this is a, an a architectural model in timber um, made early on in the process. And you see uh, here the building. And the, basically, it's a, a rectangular building with facets. And then it's oriented uh, to its, well, here to the, to the left, looking at you at the river at the bank junction view, which is, um, I think, from the point of view of the historic England who are protecting the backdrops of the tall building, of the historic buildings, um, this view is very sensitive for them. So they wanted a very calm backdrop. Um, from this, this uh, picture was taken from the river, and I think it shows in the most heightened sense the point of the facets. The glass, and I'll talk about the glass a little bit too. Um, the idea here of this tower then is that it's playing with light and its shapes. Um, and the glass is a, 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 a light, the gl glass is a low iron glass with a light reflective coating on the out outer surface. Um, and the, the, the client, excuse me, the client wanted um, a clear glass building. And I urged him against that because in fact a clear glass building appears black. So the, the building known as the cheese grater or the building known as the gherkin have uh, what's called clear glass. And because they're clear glass, they have uh, solar coatings to protect the internal occupant from too much heat gain. <clears throat> and this is turning them dark green or black. We use a cavity facade, uh, which allows us to have a, 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 a solar blind in the cavity. And then the glass outside blind can be low iron glass and we have a light silvery coating to give the illusion of clarity um, because it's reflecting the light of the sky. I'll talk about that a bit more too. But it, um, So from different angles you get different um, vantage points obviously of the building stepping and again you'll have um, sometimes the building appearing very slender and other places very wide. This is where people are, if you're approaching from Liverpool Street Station, it's one of the main gateways into the city from the east. Um, and again, from the south. The, the facade was a critical element of the design and it was more or less part of the design from very early on. Because with a tall building, of course, the question is, um, how to make it as sustainable as possible and how to use as little energy as possible for the operation of the building. Um, the blinds in the cavity are movable and operable, just as you would have blinds on the outside of a building, but they're protected by that outer layer of glass, so they don't have to be quite as robust. They do need to withstand the heat gain in the cavity, and they do need to withstand, be able to operate um, over time, so they were tested at like 30,000 cycles under extreme heat conditions um, to make sure that they would work. <clears throat> and the, the cavity is pressurized, so the facade has its own mechanical system. Uh, air is permanently pumped into the cavity in order to um, keep dust from leaking into the cavity, which means you don't have to open the cavity to clean. The ceiling height uh, the clear ceiling height is three meters, and I realize in, in Czech Republic that's probably standard. It's standard in Germany as well. Um, in Paris or in London, the standard is 2.75 meters. So the, um, again, Stuart Lipton took this decision very early on. It cost four floors of space over the height of the building, which is a considerable economic loss. But they felt that adding this extra quality would be beneficial 
to the occupant. Um, and then we stepped the facade, the, the ceiling higher at the facade perimeter in order to gain even a little bit more daylight. In London, they don't measure the daylight on the floor as, the, as they do here. Um, so there isn't yet uh, this measured um, awareness of a measurement of daylight, but it's, I think it's coming, it will become more important. Um, I mentioned the structure, the stability structure is critical in a tall building. The concrete core um, does a lot of the work, which means that the steel uh, can weigh less, can do less work. And the outriggers uh, at levels 25 and 41 further stiffen the building because the wind is trying to push it uh, sideways. Um, this building is 40% larger than the pinnacle design which preceded it, but it, the steel is 15% less weight. So that gives you an idea of the effectiveness of the st stability structure. Um, the core was what you call jump formed, meaning they, they built a, a, a um, formwork around the shape of the core, and then they slid that formwork or they jacked that formwork up um, and actually, because the core was so large, there were two of those, and they went at different speeds. Um, and that, that leaves a much better finish, actually, or a much smoother finish than you would have if you re disassembled and reassembled the formwork every time. The um, main objective of the structure was to reuse the foundations which were built for the Pinnacle Tower, um, which meant that we had some columns that didn't come down straight. They had to, to walk their way to the earlier foundations. Um, and that was uh, quite challenging during the construction of the building. This is just a quick video that the structural engineer WSP made to illustrate um, what they had to do. So the pinnacle design was built up to the ninth floor of the core, which you see here. Um, and the foundations were built, so there are piles that are 65 meters deep into the Thanet Sands. Um, and we kept uh, the piles, obviously, and we kept the lower basement. We kept um, the ground floor slab, but underneath that, we removed some of the slab in order to stiffen the raft, or build more raft, and to add more piles. And the new piles were added by rigs that went into the basement so that it would reduce noise and um, irritation to the neighbors. There's a medieval church from the 12th century right next to the site, which is very active, it has service every day. <clears throat> so it was very important to them that we reduce the noise, um, particularly during the service. Um, so the, this shows the piles that were there on the site and then the new piles that were added. Um, so. It's a lot of piles now. <laughs> um. So the blue are areas are where we had to add additional raft in order to stiffen um, the, the foundation to handle the new core above and to strengthen the new, t new concrete core above. On the ground floor, most of the structure was retained. Most of the, st of the horizontal structure was retained, which again reduced um, the irritation to commuters on the street. This shows the columns that had to change direction as they came down from the ideal location above into the required location in the floor. And then th these show the floor plates being added as they follow behind the core as it was being um, poured upward. I think um, one of the most challenging um, aspects oh. sorry, this shows the outriggers. <clears throat> the outriggers um, to reduce the sway of the building. So even with the outriggers, there's still 600 millimeters of sway at the top in the most extreme wind conditions, which don't happen very often. I mean, that would be in a storm situation, um, for example. So, and the, the shape of the 
belt truss around the outriggers uh, is not very pretty in the sense that uh, if you were doing a new building from scratch and, and putting your foundations where you wanted them, you could organize it uh, more, more geometrically perfectly. At the top, you're looking here at the top of the building where the public access floors are located. Okay. Um, the, one of the most challenging aspects was how to stiffen the south east corner of the building where there was a lot of new mass above and not enough foundation. Um, and so you see, you're looking at a three meter deep beam um, that transfers some of the structure. And there were um, column pile caps that had to be dug out and reinforced as well. And there were columns that were actually not being held up by anything <laughs> while the building of the core above was built to the 17th floor before those were put back. That was quite a, a tricky part. Um, the the uh, environmental services or the mechanical services were, I would say, maybe the, the um, more standard uh, for the time period. I think there would be more innovation now. Um, what was innovative about that were the, the technology um, smart building platform controls. So I, I didn't mention, for example, when people arrive at the building, um, if you want, you can come in using your phone, um, just you have an app on your phone and you say you want to come in and you, just, and you basically can open the app, um, open the, the gate with your phone. If you're a visitor, you're sent a QR code, just as you're boarding a train, you can board the building. Um, so in fact, the traditional reception isn't necessary unless someone doesn't like to use the phone, which, um, so there, is a, there are people there to help you if you need. Um, the other big benefit of the technology is, of course, monitoring the technology, monitoring the equipment in the building. So monitoring the use of the building and monitoring failure, predicting failure. All of the tenants in the building have agreed to share a 3D model of their space. So there's a complete digital twin of the building. So not just the structure and the architecture, but all the internal fit out of all the tenant spaces as well. The sensors in the building then tell the tenants where their space is not being fully used and they can consider if they want to reconfigure their space to reuse all of it more or if they want to keep it that way. Um, and the idea of the predictive failure is to help the building management know when equipment is going to fail and order the components in advance and not need to wait until something breaks or wait until it's reported. And this saves, um, it was developed together with a, a technology company in the US who used that on their own campus. And they save six to 10% of energy year on year. So each year they make an additional energy saving by using this information. Um, so. I think I, with regard to other technology, you're probably becoming used to it yourself. There's ubiquitous Wi-Fi everywhere. Um, there's what they call blown fiber data. So instead of applying for a telephone line that you wait three months to get, there is a phone uh, fiber which is blown through the building on, on your needs. Um, and the building has a wired score of platinum. Uh, the lifts also had something innovative about them, which are uh, two things I actually I should mention. Um, they had what they call the Otis Sky Build. So the, normally when you build a building, you see this hoist and it's moving very slowly and it's very noisy. And on a tall building, it can make uh, the timing of delivery for both the materials and the labor um, a real logistics nightmare. Um, so Otis developed what they call the Sky Build. Basically, the lift moves like a caterpillar by itself. So uh, they can install the lifts instead of waiting for the concrete shafts to be built um, and then installing the lifts at the end of the project, um, end of the construction project. They can install the lifts after just a few floors of shaft have been installed. And then uh, as the building shaft grows taller, the lift can, within four hours, go from serving, for example, floors ground through six. In four hours, it can climb to level seven and then serve levels one through seven. And it's literally like a caterpillar. It uh, sticks a, uh, its arms into the concrete shaft and then uh, climbs its way up. They have a video online you can watch if you're 
that interested in. Um, and the other aspect of the lifts, I'll let, I'll let the video explain. Um, Oh, there's no sound. Okay. Uh -huh. um, normally, lifts are not used during a fire. Um, but in this building, because there's public access at the top especially, there was a concern that people, elderly people or even fit people wouldn't be able to get down 60 floors in an, in an emergency. And so we worked with the fire department to come up with a way of using the passenger lifts for evacuating people during a fire. And this is done by um, basically hardening the floor slabs above and below the transfer floors. So people do walk down to a transfer floor, but then they can take the lift down the rest of the way. Um, sorry, normally there is an explanation that comes with the video. Let's skip ahead. So it allows a much safer and faster evacuation for, especially for people who are, who are not fit. Um, so that, that's my last slide. I, I think um, I include the project team because there were, in, in any project, there are a lot of people that we work with um, who make, the, make our day-to-day -day life challenging or fun, depending. Uh, and who, who all participate in shaping the, the project. And I think um, it's something as students we don't um, necessarily see or understand. Um, but um, it, it, I think architecture has to deal with a lot of different constraints and a lot of different objectives, not only for the client, but also for the other stakeholders, the people who occupy the building or the, the people who live around the building as well. Um, and uh, it's a big effort for a lot of people, so thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Karen. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to have a lecture about a one building because it is quite exceptional to have a one project lecture because very often we have many projects but never have time to go deeper into the building. So I think uh, everybody, uh, at least I was impressed when I saw this uh, in London. First of all, I got the QR code and then I was passing with my QR code as a visitor into Bishopsgate, and it was my first life experience of not having a reception anywhere. And then feeling in a building uh, that is so big, so high, like if I was in a small building. And I think that is uh, a, a lot of work was done with the artists, but also with the, the choice of materials and everything. Uh, I hope there are questions. I, I'll start with my first one. I, I noticed Landscape Architects West 8. What landscape was there? <laughs> uh, there are trees that are part of the wind mitigation strategy. Um, these are metasequoia trees, which are, um, they, they look like evergreen trees. They do actually, they have needles, but they do actually lose their needles. Um, and, and, and these have not survived. So they have to be re replaced. So it was not a good question. <laughs> oh, it's a very important question. I think um, at the time we planted the trees, the city had forbidden the use of the London plane tree because the, there was a disease um, being spread at the time. And also because the Transport for London, who control the traffic on Bishop's Gate, um, were also objecting to trees because they um, the double-deck buses crash into the trees. So uh, this was part of the reason for the choice of the tree. Okay, are they going to be replanted? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. So please, questions? Yes. Um, I'm very curious uh, that you called it a vertical village. 
Uh, I don't know about many villages, and uh, I haven't visited any where you have need for a facial recognition, where you have 12,000 people living uh, above each other. Uh, I think that uh, name Vertical Village is a propaganda slogan. Could you explain that to us? Where's that village's village character in this building? Because when you move from one floor to the other, you need a chip. I worked on the project called Fusion Police in Singapore, which has similar premises uh, at the be uh, promises at the beginning. At the end, you can't move from one door to another one without your chip, etc. Et so where's the green uh, vertical village in your project? Thank you. We are actually able to move. Once you're in the building, you can move from floor to floor. It's a fair question. Um, and I think, uh, of course, it's for an office building and not for residential. So the idea is that um, because the tenants are taking one, two, or three floors each, they're not taking, most of them are, oh, there's only one tenant who is taking more than that. Um, and so they're, they're hoping that their staff will be happy to come and work if they can use the amenities. Because what the tenants are discovering is that the people want to come into work, but not to go into the office. They want to go into these other spaces. But why do I need facial recognition for the time? You, Which village? Needs? In fact, we're, yeah, we're not at the moment. It's not being used yet, and partly because. But but it's there, so it's a it's, fundamental it's, impingement uh, on human liberties. It's opt-in only, so you're not obliged to use it. First of all, yeah, for that reason. Another question. Yes, please. I have two short questions. First is how large, I will follow your question, how large uh, was the area around the building that West or you or West Aid design? It's a fair question. And the second is uh, where the uh, results from wind tunnel the same as the reality is now? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the area that we had control of around the building was small um, because the, the physical size of the site was also basically we had the site which was the building and then we had the public pavement to the street or the public pavement to the street on the north and the, and the public highway to the, to the east. Um, so we didn't have very much surface area at the ground level. Um, the wind results uh, actually, we had to test for multiple conditions for the wind results. Um, we had to test for as if no other buildings would be built. We had to test for the new high-rises that would be built after our building. And we also had to test for this situation where if you demolished a building in order to build another building, what would the circumstances be? Mm -hmm. And they were diff very, very different results in all cases. Um, and I would say... The, yes, they, they are matching the situation in the wind tunnel, including the danger spots. Uh, and uh, thankfully, the conditions, um, because the building to the south has been approved at a taller height than initially, and this is improving the wind conditions for our area. Mm. But we need the trees, too. Another question? Yes, please. The mic, the mic is coming. I would like to ask about the role of an architect, because of uh, uh, certainly a lot of decisions were taken before you, you were involved. So uh, how far uh, you just designed the decision somebody else did? and how much you, uh, do you impact on the basic decisions? That's a good question. I think the developer um, himself uh, is taking a lot of the decisions and he's relying on me or the other <coughs> members of the consultant team to give him advice what decision to be taken. Because it, it, as you see, there are so many areas of the city that are impacted. Um, that the role of the architect, 
I think it's, it's the same as on a smaller project, but it simply the impact is greater and greater as the building is, is larger and larger. So the decisions uh, can be influenced by the architect, but in the end they have to be made by the city planner or by the developer. Is that, am I touching on what you mean or? So it's difficult to explain it shortly. Yes. Uh, uh, but uh, my question was, uh, uh, at which moment uh, you were involved? Because uh, uh, many developers as uh, kind of secondary architects who prepare for them the basic calculations and and, uh, and floor areas and I don't know what whatever, and then uh, the uh, architect who is de designing is just a kind of following the basic structure which is already gi given. Okay. So uh, you probably understand what I mean. I think um, in London it's a little bit different than in some other cities because the zoning is not prescribed, so there's a lot to negotiate with the city planner and the, and the owner needs the architect for this phase. Um, I, I started in being involved in this site in 2003. Um, and so I, I'm not claiming that I made the decisions, but I was participating uh, with the city planner and with the, the owners changed uh, many times um, and the developer changed. So, um, and I think, at the same time, the, the biggest change was the energy regulations, um, the occupation density, which the st tenant standard went from one person per 12 or 14 square meters net area to one person per eight square meters. So that meant 50% more infrastructure required. So again, a bigger building. So, I th and, and then, uh, the other big change was that, it, it, of course, it's a commercial building, so the client's objective is to, to make money. But the real uh, occupier objective changed from wanting to have a perfect building to wanting to have a, the best qualities that would support his uh, workforce. We, we went to Australia to, um, for just one week. In fact, it was a quite intense trip to visit five of the top performing bank buildings in Sydney and five in Melbourne, and to interview the facility manager and, and um, the human resources uh, lead, and to find out why their banks, why their staff were outperforming um, people in the rest of the world. And they offered the amenities um, that have been questioned. Um, they offered um, people the freedom to work in different locations in the building um, when they wanted, and it made people feel much more in charge of themselves and, and have much more control over their environment. And therefore, they, they produced better work. They had, a, and I think, um, you know, work in an office has changed a lot over the last decades. I, I would say the original typologies of the office building. Um, were loosely based on the factory assembly line with rows and rows of desks, or in some countries, rows and rows of offices, uh, which is perhaps um, even more deadly. Now people are no longer uh, asked to come to work and sit down and, and just produce a quantity of things. They're asked to come and be creative. So even bankers have creative projects. Uh, and these people uh, are smart enough to know that they need to be uh, rested, they need to be stimulated, they need to be eating healthy, or, or you know, otherwise they don't feel well and then they, they can't come up with interesting ideas. No. You mentioned that uh, London doesn't have zoning laws, that everything has to be ne negotiated. That is very different to the, the continental to the, and, and to the Czech system. Uh, can you explain a little bit more how the negotiation happens? Because, I mean, what, what we're looking at is an environment where you have very tiny buildings, historical buildings, um, 
mid-sized buildings and suddenly skyscrapers and how come somebody gets the right to build a skyscraper and have all this uh, income from the from the investment and other people just have their little old historical building there so there there is zoning but it's not um, prescribed as you to say so it's not codified um, North American cities have a prescribed zoning so Chicago or New York or all of Germany, France, um, you know, the, the, it's clear when you buy the site, you know how many floors, you know what use, and in this instance, the architect draws an image that fits in something that someone else has decided. In London, the um, planning uh, law is, um, it, it exists, but it's, it's defined a little bit less precisely. I mean, I would say English law is the same, way, it's more on precedent and discussion. Um, th there are some prescribed facts which are to do with protecting historic buildings, um, protecting conservation areas, protecting the monuments of St. Paul's or, or Westminster Palace or the Tower of London. Um, so there, you know, when you're doing a building which is in the view of these national monuments, then there is a different kind of scrutiny. But again, it's it, there's some limits, but then there's also negotiation about the color juxtaposition or the shape juxtaposition. Um, after that, it, it's, I would say, economically driven in the sense that uh, the city has to deal with growth or changes in demand for uses. Uh, and so they have to negotiate and I, you, you could see, for example, how long it took to negotiate a, the high-speed train lines. Um, you know, they know it's important to link the regional cities, but it's very difficult to get the agreement to go ahead and do that. Unlike um, France or Germany, who can, the state can just say, well, we have to do this, and it's uh, too bad for you. Um, I think what, what does become difficult, I mean, both systems have pros and cons. Neither one is perfect. Um, and I think there is no such thing as a perfect zoning system. Um, it, it becomes difficult in London when they have to figure out uh, how to deal with a large area, because if you're only dealing with private plots, you can't... Uh, it takes a very long time then to implement a change for an area. Um, and, and they struggle as well when they're trying to do... Now in London, we're dealing with population growth that, that has occurred. Uh, they've found areas of land where they could build larger districts, um, but they don't really have a, a national model for how to decide what the zoning should be um, in these locations. They're not in the habit, like I think the, um, my experience in the French and German systems is with their competitions that are held over a period of years, sometimes rerunning, rerunning, rerunning the competitions um, to debate uh, among architectural professionals, but also the public um, and other professionals, what would be the right thing for their city. Um, you see it, I guess you're doing it here in Prague as well, and you've been doing it for 10 years or more. So I think there are pros and cons to both, and neither is perfect. Any question? Yes, please. Uh, I would like to about uh, I would like to ask about the sustainability more. Uh, 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 I wonder if the or my question is uh, if the building uh, treats uh, rainwater somehow or grey water or uh, or it does produce its own energy somehow by the solar panels panels or wind turbines or something of that sort. Thank you. Um, we, we do treat the rainwater, um, that's a requirement. Uh, there are no photovoltaic panels. I think um, these are becoming more feasible than they were before in terms of cost um, to use on buildings. Um, they're, they're mostly effective when you can have a very large array, a large surface area, um, and the best performing ones are opaque. So. Um, not yet. Uh, and the wind turbines as well, at the time, the 
silent ones hadn't yet been invented, so now we're investigating the use of, of um, bladeless wind turbines that can be mounted on buildings that even for residential purposes wouldn't be annoying. Um, I, I don't know how effective they are in terms of uh, energy output. So, but it's, a, it's, it's the right question to ask. <laughs> yeah. How's the heating uh, solved and the cooling? Sorry? The heating and the cooling, how is it solved? Um, well, there shouldn't need to be any heating. It's calculated. I think most office buildings, um, well, when people were occupying them, they don't need heating. Um, and the cooling is the main um, problem. So in this building, as I said, it's not very advanced. Um, in my opinion, it's using traditional technology. And the, the most um, beneficial aspect in that regard is the technology that says there's nobody in that zone. It doesn't need to be cooled or, he or heated or the air doesn't need to be treated. I think that there are, from my viewpoint, there are more advanced systems that are now coming onto the market. Um, which have been already used in the continent for a while, that in London they have been a little bit slower to adopt. Um, Maybe this summer changes the opinion of the <laughs> British. Please. I think the pandemic changed people's opinions because uh, they want more individual control now. All right. Uh, hi, Karen. Thanks for the lecture. I enjoyed it very much. It was really great to, as you said, to see one big building being having the story told. I have a um, question, maybe a tiny one. So there were, let's say, three slides about this soft software, about this like IT controlling management, etc. Uh, did it uh, in any way define or like influenced the design, the actual spatial design, or is it just wires and zeros and ones? It did not influence the um, design. I think what would be interesting would be to see if, you know, now that there are more buildings that use this software, if, if it would influence the building design in the future. Um, I think what, what uh, for me, what is, I mean, the amenities were uh, added to the building after the design was through the planning process. And I would like to see um, more expression of those uh, in the future more links to outdoor spaces. It's quite difficult on a tall building to deal with outdoor spaces because the, the, they're worried about people jumping. Um, and so if you enclose them, fine. I think that's a, a good idea from the point of view of wind as well, but to, to create a, a third climate which is protected. There is a terrace uh, on the top of, of the building, um, which is a nine meter high terrace and it's covered with a grating so that people can't climb out. They've still had people climbing on the top. Anyway, they find a way. So. Okay. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much for your exciting presentation. I uh, really liked it a lot. I have a question about the wellness um, aspect. Um, if I understood very quickly from your presentation, there are four to five zones with kinds of amenities for the, the people in the, in the offices. Um, Still, to, to my estimate, I think it's uh, probably not enough. <laughs> so do you think it's, it's really balanced? It's in proportion to what the people need? Or would you say office buildings in the future would need to offer more of these kinds of amenities? Yeah, at the moment, there are about 8% of the office space is dedicated to the amenities. Um, I agree with you. I think that more and more of the space will become amenity. Um, and there are... Uh, in addition to the 8%, there are now four floors extra that are being used for conferencing and um, short-term workspace that are very popular as well. I think that um, lease structures of companies, and this professional real estate people right now disagree with me because I'm not a real estate expert, but uh, in London, normally a lease would have been 20 years. So it's almost like buying a, a, you know, a short-term lease on, an apart on a building. Um, they have break clauses at five years and, and these are becoming more significant as people uh, are looking for better and better quality. And I, I, what I see happening is that uh, companies are going either toward even higher specification than what I've just shown you, or they're going to basically what you would say the, the third tier 
status of offices but because that's more affordable, which are maybe historic buildings or have opening windows and they're smaller and they don't have perfect space. But they are of, of desirable for some companies for those reasons. Uh, I think that the bigger companies, I, you start to see bigger companies becoming um, conglomerates of smaller companies, in fact, and, and these company structures are changing constantly because people don't know. They're, they're either growing or shrinking or they're selling or... Um, and, and so, will a company want to lease for 20 years or will the company want to lease for five years when, in fact, maybe three months or six months is a more uh, normal horizon? And, and people do want to come to work for a reason and not just to work, but to, to, to have a, a reason to be there. So either they're meeting someone or they hope to meet someone and that's why they've come to the office. And, and so a traditional office space is perhaps not uh, what you need and, and you maybe even don't want to see the person in your company or in their company. You want to meet them in a, in a different kind of space. And that's what the new spaces at the, that are be coming into the building now are, are offering are these third spaces, people say. Yes, please. Hello, thank you for the lecture as well. It was really amazing to see um, the process of designing of such a complex building. And I would like to ask you about uh, the sustainability more because there were like many sustainable aspects in this building and um, I'm wondering who is responsible for the decision to make the uh, sustainable aspects. If was it like you or was it the client or did the city regulate, like ask for the sustainable solution? In my opinion, the clients will implement sustainability for one of two reasons. <clears throat> Their tenants are demanding it or the government legislation is demanding it. So because normally a developer is uncomfortable doing something he hasn't done before or the insurance company is uncomfortable insuring a building which is using new technology it makes it very difficult to apply new ideas that maybe the expert researcher is coming up with to add into the building because the insurance company says well i'm not providing you insurance i don't have any data on the performance of this and so you end up with the most uh, adventurous ideas are actually done in buildings where the owner is occupying the building and he wants this or she wants this. Um, I think that as government legislation gets more stringent, then the construction industry has to find more ways, better ways to meet the requirements and engineers are doing this. But ultimately, even the sustainability on one site is... Uh, unable to save the planet by just one means. I think that you really have to look at the larger picture and ask how, how can a region be sustainable? Um, you know, how do you organize your density of activities so that you rely on the public transport that you do have or that you um, don't require that people take trips that they don't otherwise need to take? And, and you can't achieve that if you don't have a minimum population density. Um, and the, the sustainability requirements are quite difficult um, in terms of explaining uh, to the city planners who probably don't have any training in the engineering that they need to understand the, what, what are the targets um, and who don't have um, you know, enough qualified personnel and they're trying to they're trying they're doing what they can to compensate for that but even among we professionals, we, we don't have enough training in it either. My, my feeling. Karen, when you were doing uh, Danube House 20 years ago, I mean, that was at uh, yes. know-how because you were putting in a lot of experiments, thanks to the client, to Europolis, to mm -hmm. Mr. Lunardon, uh, that uh, were, would not have been allowed in the EU and we were not part of the EU and you could test it out here. Mm -hmm. And so you've been in the sustainability design thinking for, for very many years. But the story is different with a high-rise, with a skyscraper like that, where the pressure 
I mean, we're in London, which is the, the city in Europe which has most uh, economic pressure uh, compared to Prague, because Prague is very, the Danube House is generous with space and generous with the technologies. Danube House was uh, exceptional for that reason, that the client had the ambition to make a sustainable building. And we um, actually, the underfloor air system is, is already or was already in use in Europe. Um, but uh, we had the benefit of bringing air as well under the building, which pre-tempered the air. So in summer, it makes it slightly cooler, and in winter, makes it slightly warmer. Um, so this was... Uh, an expense for the building because we had to dig additional um, ground next to the river, which was uh, expensive. Um, but I, I think uh, now, actually, po post-pandemic, people are saying that it's a healthier way of air conditioning the building to have the air come from the floor. It's uh, partially cooled as well, but or the concrete structure can act as a partial thermal mass. Um, we don't use as much concrete in London. It's a steel-oriented culture. The, the aggregates for the concrete are not as um, don't generate as strong a concrete as they do uh, on the continent. Um, a tall building has the benefit of, of um, the vertical structure to be able to offer. I mean, in my view, the, the, ben the main benefit of a tall building is when you have the public transport already coming to the location and that you can exploit that transportation and um, build a higher density in one area. In, in the city of London, the um, business ecosystem relies on people being able to walk within five or ten minutes to, to another business, and there are a lot of businesses who, who feed off each other, who, who, who meet each other regularly all day long. So this physical proximity is reducing the need for other types of transport. Makes sense. It's a long way of talking. Last question. One more. Um, I've been waiting till the end to see if anyone else is interested about that. But my question, I've got two questions and they, might appear somewhat naive or kind of silly, but bear with me, please. So uh, you mentioned that the highest part is basically this like view gallery, and in newest high-rise high buildings in London, it's required to uh, have one. And you also mentioned that it, the, the such spaces have like fewer and fewer visitors, and they might be rethought in the future and could you please explain why do you think they have like less and less visitors or is it like is it is it a, a concern of this specific building or is it like an a, a general trade uh, or like not, not trade a general trend um and how is it different from let's say like london eye right so let's compare those like giants and the second question is concerning that pathway you mentioned is just like the, the path underneath the building where people can just like walk from one smaller street to another. Uh, it might have just slipped my attention or I, I would like to, um, to hear more about that. I would like to ask you to elaborate more on that path because as I imagine it to myself, it's just like a gateway underneath the building and I can imagine this space being quite a hostile piece of uh, urban environment and how, how do you make it less hostile, how do you make it more like hospitable using some um, design concepts, if there is some design concept that can fix that. Thank you. So uh, I'll start with your second question and go back to the first one. Um, the first, the narrow passageway is a traditional concept in the city. There are many of them. The people are, are accustomed to them. Uh, most of them are actually just opaque, um, like tiled alleyways. Some of them you can touch both sides, and uh, they're brightly lit. And, and thankfully, the city has 
no significant crime problem so that people are not a afraid to use them. Um, what we uh, did to make this, this passageway more appealing, first of all, you, you can look in on one side to the public entrance to the top of the building and on the other side to the an entrance to the offices and to the market. Um, and at the end of there is a cafe that is on the public space at the back. Um, and we also uh, have the same glass artist produced some pieces that are some of which are on the walls and some of which are hanging uh, in the passageway. And the real benefit of the passageway is because you have a, a very large number of people going from bank uh, tube station toward the insurance buildings that are on the east side of Bishopsgate. So there's a, a huge number of people using the route, so it, it's more hospitable in that regard. Um, and then when, it, when you, Bishopsgate itself has a lot of traffic, when you reach Crosby Square on the east side, where we closed the street to traffic, um, and then we have some additional trees that are uh, smaller um, flower-bearing trees in the, in the spring and, and uh, planters where people can sit down, so it's a little bit more pleasant when you reach that side. Um, with regard to the viewing galleries, uh, there are uh, 10 tall buildings planned for the city, which have been consented that are not built yet. And they are all intended to have this public viewing gallery at the top. Um, I'm just doubting whether there need to be 10 of them. Um, I think that uh, public space closer to the ground is more meaningful. Um, especially for the people working in the city, that if they, if they want to take a break uh, at any point during the day or at lunchtime, they probably are on a little bit of time pressure um, and it's easier if the public space is on the ground or maybe one or two floors or three floors above the ground where they can um, you know, still have nature and uh, hear the other people and uh, so. But I think the, the city recognizes that as well, and they um, are looking at how to close streets to make some of it, because the, this city being a medieval street pattern, the streets are very narrow, the sidewalk is very narrow, um, and it, there isn't a lot of public open space. So they're looking at whether they can permanently or temporarily close some streets to make them, which they did during the pandemic, and it was very successful um, to make them usable for uh, pedestrians. Um, and, you know, there's a procedure that even if there's no zoning, they still have to go through the procedure of uh, negotiating with the traffic authorities how to manage the possible street closures. So I think... We are exhausted with questions. I thank everybody, and I have a little certificate for you oh, so you to much. remember our school, to remember thank you. this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you all for coming.